attacks were beaten back. Then, after 145 days of siege, the exhausted Christian defenders finally negotiated a truce. The Ottomans had won. Victory did more than deliver roads to the empire. Suleiman was now a sultan to be taken seriously. His march of conquest had begun. Europe grew to fear the name of Suleiman. But within his own borders, he had another reputation. Islamic history remembers him as Kunan, the lawgiver. Ottomans uh, were really uh, bureaucrats in full sense of the word. They kept every single record, and in order to control the different peoples who participated in the world of the Ottomans, they had to have very carefully sorted out legal systems. Under Suleiman, a single legal system was defined for the sprawling empire. His laws would later become the basis of constitutions for several other nations. Well, Suleiman was the supreme monarch of the area. He was the center of the world. He inaugurated a classical age in Ottoman architecture, commissioning some of the most spectacular buildings the world has ever seen. Suleiman was in a unique position of wealth. And, and of consolidation, and he focused his attention on developing monumental architecture to commemorate his great dynasty and himself. Great religious architecture can really give people a sense of what is at the heart of the faith. Grandeur and majesty are the things that come to mind when Muslims think about God. A building that is grand and majestic can immediately remind people of the glory of God. Suleiman's chief architect, Senon, was a man whose vision perfectly complemented the empire builder. Senon perfected the signature structure of Islam, the domed mosque. His career spanned half a century and produced well over 300 buildings, including the refurbishment of one of the most important monuments in Islam, the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. But for the Sultan, of course, he built his masterpiece, the Suleymaniye Mosque in Istanbul. It is truly befitting Sinan, who is called the Great Master. These buildings were horrendously expensive, huge things that took many, many years to build and a great deal of architectural talent and engineering skill and engineering experience. When they built a mosque like the Suleymaniye, they were doing it to say, yeah, I've got the power, I've got the money, I am the sultan, I'm the king of kings. But at the same time, there was also tremendous spiritual value in these things. The symbolism is not only that of empire, but of faith. In the spirit of Muhammad's teaching, the Great Mosque was a center of social services, complete with a hospital, school, and library. At its inauguration, it's said Suleiman gazed at it with awe and exclaimed, O oh Solomon, I have surpassed thee. No less impressive was Suleiman's palace. Topkopi was both the seat of government and his private dwelling. Suleiman was also a great patron of the arts. And since the empire was very rich, the best artisans were there. So everything started flourishing. The architecture uh, or the arts of his period uh, show the first golden age of the Ottoman world.
everything that came out of his palace is exquisite. Suleiman himself was a goldsmith. Ottomans believed that every sultan had to have a tangible trade. Being a sultan was not considered a practical or a tangible trade. And he was a very demanding patron, insisted on checking the work, even commissioned few things. And I think each artisan group or each corps uh, working for the palace tried to outdo one another to please the sultan because to please him had wonderful rewards. And the Ottomans, of course, exercised quite a lot of influence on the European imagination and the royal and the political, if you will, ceremony and pomp of the Ottomans was such that it would have humbled um, any citizen of the known world then. Uh, this was arguably one of the greatest uh, world empires and European observers could not walk away without feeling of respect for the sheer power of the Ottomans. In public, Suleiman required that all those around him remain completely silent, while he made his wishes known with the slightest nod or gesture. It must have been a tremendously impressive sight to see the courtyard of the palace filled with some six or seven thousand janissaries and other functionaries, no one saying a word. What was going on here was the creation of a sovereignty so mysterious and yet so far-reaching as to be seen as nearly divine. As Suleiman's power grew, his lifelong friend Ibrahim rose in the court structure. And Ibrahim Pasha, who became a Pasha later on, became his devoted Grand Vizier. In fact, Ibrahim married his sister. So they were not only good friends, they were also uh, related. Ibrahim campaigned with his own army, growing in influence and ambition, till his power was second only to Suleiman's. But for power and ambition, the secret world of the Sultan's harem had no equal. Contrary to the Western stereotype, it was not the Sultan's playpen, but lay at the center of dynastic power. The harem was the private quarters of the Sultan. We tend to think of the harem as where the women live, but what it means is the place where you're not on display. Home is what it means. Islam allowed the Sultan four wives and many concubines. It was a system designed to produce heirs, is what it was. When you look into the actual details of how these things were carried out, it was hardly anything terribly erotic. I mean, the Sultan did not have much choice in his selection of female companions. The Sultan was not in a position to look around and say, I want her, you know, because his mother would have a lot to say about it. With his first wife, Suleiman had a son and heir, Mustafa. But while he was in his mid-thirties, the Sultan fell deeply in love with a Slavic slave girl named Harem. In the West, we know her by a different name, Roxalana. Roxalana would bear him a rival heir and become Suleiman's most trusted confidant. The Sultan was supposed to be protected from any undue influences. He was supposed to be protected from any rivals. And in a way, this creates a vacuum around his person into which the harem life can enter. And so 
the fact that he was so protected works in a funny way to expose him to the influence of his female companions with whom he spent so much time. And there were tremendously intelligent and ambitious women around him, Roxelana being the most famous of all. Suleiman is a complex character. A man that we know from his own life was capable of the tenderest emotions, both toward his male friends and especially toward his, uh, his, the great love of his life, his wife, Hurem Sultan, and toward his family as well. He had a number of extremely talented sons uh, on whom he lavished a great deal of affection. Suleiman groomed his firstborn son, Mustafa, for power. In the Ottoman tradition, the young prince entered the military and quickly won recognition as a talented general. Mustafa was clearly the heir apparent. For Suleiman, the future of his empire seemed limitless. I am God's slave and sultan of this world. Suleiman would carve on a conquered fortress. I am Suleiman, in whose name the Friday sermon is read in Mecca and Medina. In Baghdad, I am the Shah. In the Byzantine realms, I am the Caesar. And in Egypt, the Sultan. He, of course, at the height of his powers, clearly saw himself as dwarfing all his rivals. Uh, perhaps rightly so. One of Suleiman's greatest rivals was to the east, the empire of the Persian Safavids. This was a Muslim enemy whose rival creed made them fierce antagonists of the Ottomans for centuries. The Safavids were also Turkic in their ethnic origins, and indeed spoke Turkish as a language of daily life. But they were moving into the Muslim world, unlike the Ottomans who were moving into the West. So for the Ottoman Empire, they formed sort of the boundaries, uh, the easternmost uh, boundaries of the Ottoman realm. The Safavid dynasty was Shiite Muslims, bitter rivals to the Sunni Ottomans. According to the Shiites, a leader had to be designated by his predecessor and had to be of the family of Muhammad. According to the Sunni view, it was not designation that was necessary and a person could be a leader of the community without... 